I'll start the recording. All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our last installment of Gardening 101. Thank you. Um, lots of familiar names on here tonight. Everybody's really been sticking with it through the whole the, uh, session, so I really appreciate that. Just a couple housekeeping items that we've been covering. Everybody's automatically muted. Camera is automatically off when we join because we're doing it in webinar style. If you want to ask a question, you're, um, we'll probably be saving most of these for the end, so feel free to type it in the moment, but we'll get to it. I promise we're not ignoring you. You can use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. If you're using the chat, though, um, do ask that you change under the two. Um, it's, it automatically defaults to all panelists. Change it to all panelists and attendees, and everybody can see the chat. We can get some good discussion going on. People can share their experiences if you have a specific question. Um, our speaker tonight is our wildlife specialist, uh, Dr. Sheldon Owen, and I'm going to turn it over to Sheldon. I'll turn my camera off and he will take it away. Thanks, Emily. Uh, good evening, everyone. Let me make sure I can uh, bring up the screen and share it. Make sure to see, is everyone able to see that screen now? Yes. Okay, good, good, good. That's what, that's what we hope. Um, so thanks again for joining us, everyone. I know it's a beautiful day out there. Emily was just sharing about the, a beautiful day out there. So uh, I'm glad you can come in a little bit. I hate to bring you away from a beautiful day, but maybe we'll, we'll touch on some topics that are of interest to you. Uh, I am Sheldon Owen, Extension Wildlife Specialist, uh, housed here in Morgantown, but with statewide responsibilities. And it uh, makes it a little bit easier. I know this COVID has kind of got us restricted and we're working from home and doing a lot more things virtual, uh, but it's a lot easier than driving over to the Eastern Panhandle and giving this talk. So it, it does make it a little, little easier on us, but I do still miss getting out and meeting with, with, with you all, meeting with the folks of West Virginia uh, and, and just traveling the state and seeing things. Uh, so tonight we're gonna talk about some backyard critter control. Uh, I believe is a topic that Emily gave me. And a lot of this is, we're really just talking wildlife damage and wildlife damage management. Uh, and I'll, I'll hit on some of the more common issues that we have here in West Virginia or that I get calls about here in the office, uh, but I'm sure that you'll probably have some unique uh, issues and conflicts that are coming up. So please yeah, put those in the chat and we'll talk about those later uh, if I don't cover it in the presentation today. Um, and so here, here on the screen, you know, I'm often talk when we start talking about critter control or, or wildlife damage management i always preface some of that with some good uh, information uh, on wildlife habitat management and then we talk about the opposite of that is wildlife damage management uh, and what i still want to hit on some of that tonight you still have to hit some of that uh, wildlife management the applied wildlife management talk or hear some of that tonight because i think it's very important and it goes a long way in helping to reduce some of the damage that we see caused by wildlife but but don't think that you're alone if you're experiencing wildlife damage because here is uh, my backyard, my back porch, and you can see uh, that the white-tailed deer, the ubiquitous white-tailed deer, just love whatever I plant as well. This is a wildlife problem. This is a wildlife specialist. He should be able to stop this. There are times I was, I was doing fairly well. You can see some electric fence line here. I was doing well at keeping deer away until I forgot to turn the electric fence on for a couple of nights. Uh, and they came back and tested the fence and said, oh, if he's not going to shock us, uh, we're going to eat uh, some of his hydrangea there. So even wildlife uh, biologists have experience with the wildlife damage. Uh, as we get started tonight, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a great time of great time of year. We've got a lot of birds coming back into the area. They're migrating through. So it's a great time for you to get outside and explore. If you're working in your garden or, or tilling up the soil, you know, take time to look up and look around and see what kind of wild animals are, are coming through. You never know what you're going to see. Uh, and this landowner up in Pennsylvania, right south of, of uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, saw this individual uh, northern cardinal come through and was feeding at its feeder. This was back in, I think, around February. Uh, but this cardinal actually is expressing both male and female characteristics. So if you look here on the on I guess the left-hand side, you'll see male northern cardinal, and on the right-hand side, this is female characteristics. It's called bilateral genandromorph, or expressing both male and female uh, traits, but it was a very interesting bird, and that's, that's a shocking find. It's very rare out in the wild, but because of the, the makeup and genetics of, of our birds and how their, their traits are passed now, sometimes this has, happens, and sometimes they can express both male and female characteristics. So 
you never know what you're going to see. So I do encourage you to get out there and, and see what kind of birds are moving through your area. And this time of year, our amphibians are, are talking to us, especially our frogs and toads across the state. We've got 15 frogs and toads, uh, officially 12 frogs and three toads that can be found across the state of West Virginia. Not in every county, so you may only have a, a portion of those. But maybe you can hear this. Here's one. If you're out in the evening, and you should be calling now, I don't know if they occur over there in Jefferson County. But if you can imagine running your thumb up and down the, the teeth of a comb, just kind of clicking the teeth of a comb, that's what this species sounds like. So hopefully you're getting out there. You're probably hearing our spring peepers calling right now. This is another one of our, our frogs, uh, chorus frogs, that can be found out across West Virginia. This is the upland chorus frog. Um, it, it looks like two, kind of looks like two different species, but these are the same species with some different uh, variation in the color patterns on their back. Um, but they sound like you're running your thumb across the teeth of a comb, giving that clicking sound uh, as they're calling. I was out in the field today, I was talking to Emily, and I got to hear a pickerel frog calling today, and it sounds like someone's snoring. So if you're out uh, in a, around a pond or a wetland, it sounds like you hear someone snoring on the opposite side of the pond, that's probably a pickerel frog. So just another reason to, uh, to get you kind of excited about what kind of critters uh, you may be seeing in your backyard. Uh, and these are the good ones that may not be causing any damage. You may not be excited to see maybe a snake or something out there, but uh, these are those that are not causing any damage, but just uh, are exciting time to be out there listening to some of these species calling and moving through our area this time of year. But so we're going to be talking about wildlife damage management. Since we're all gardeners there, you've probably heard the term integrated pest management or IPM. It's the same philosophy with integrated wildlife damage management. We just like to church it up, right? We like to have our own area that we can talk about when we're talking about damage, wildlife damage, instead of just these other uh, insects and diseases maybe coming through uh, your, your gardens. But an integrated approach is using multiple tools, techniques, methods to try to reduce that damage and manage that damage. So whatever the species may be, you kind of look at it, or, or we like to look at it in four different areas. Is there a way that we can change the habitat uh, to reduce that damage. Uh, are there any types of repellents, uh, either it be a chemical repellent or noise or, or light repellent to scare those animals away so they're no longer feeding on or, or causing damage in our backyards? There may be some form of exclusion, such as fencing or netting over our blueberry bushes to keep blue jays and robins uh, and other birds away from our blueberries. Uh, or just the final straw, or the final category is that lethal control. Do we need to actually reduce the population, lethally remove uh, some of these animals to reduce the number of animals out there to reduce that damage. So we look at these four key areas and any, any species you look at, there may or may not be uh, things that we can look at or approach or tools and techniques in all four categories, but we need to consider all four to see if there are ways that we can reduce that damage uh, without just keying in on one because there, there are many times it's going to take multiple tools to actually reduce that damage. Uh, First, looking at habitat across the scale, and this is where I, I love to pitch that, you know, good applied wildlife habitat management, or we're, we're out there managing the habitat, the vegetation across the state to provide good habitat. And this can be a kind of a double-edged sword. One, I want there to be plenty of food out in our forests and our fields for the wildlife that are out there, so they don't have to key in on what we're trying to plant in the garden. Uh, and, and the term we often talk about is carrying capacity. And we'll look at that in two different ways. There's biological carrying capacity or the number of animals that a habitat can sustain over time without seeing any damage to the habitat. So if you look at this picture here, this is a, a I can't exactly remember where this photo was taken, but this is a common picture that we'll see across West Virginia, especially in our forested areas. We're 79% forested. So we have a lot of forest, a lot of coat closed canopy forests. And if we walk out into to many of those forests around the, the, the state, we will see that there's no vegetation from the ground to about six feet up, six feet up off the ground. And this is where deer have been over browsing and we have, uh, you know, we're over carrying capacity. We have too many deer in those areas and they're eating all the vegetation from the ground to six feet up. So if you live in an area like this, if you look at your forests that are surrounding your property and you see this, the only food they may be able to reach is what you're growing in your garden, or growing in your landscaping. So if you look out 
in the surrounding habitat and you realize there's nothing for them to eat out there, then obviously what we're trying to plant is going to be the only food they have. And so they're going to make a little extra effort to try to eat what we're trying to grow. So we have to take measures and, and, and tools and techniques to try to avoid that. But if we're looking away from our, our backyards and away from our gardens and, and looking at the vegetation that is out there, we need to address that. And I think it can be double-edged sword because one, if we increase the amount of food that is out there, then we kind of increase the number of animals that can be out there, and potentially increasing the number, the number of mouths that will be eating on our gardens, uh, but it will, will reduce the likelihood that they're feeding on our gardens or, or just keying in and really destroying and hammering our, our gardens if there's more food for them to eat away from those gardens, especially some of these other techniques become a little bit more powerful, a little bit more effective now, once we start using them because they have somewhere else to go and they don't have to focus and feed on our backyards. Uh, and so, you know, many of our forests look like this. If you planted a food plot in an area where you have too many deer, your food plot may actually look like this. Uh, inside the cage where deer can't get, uh, we have some of this forest coming up, some of the brassicas and clovers coming up. But outside, it's just the grasses, you know, just the um, fescues that they don't eat. Uh, or, or would rather not eat because they can't digest it very well. So there's that biological carrying capacity of the number of animals that our habitat can sustain, but there's also something called cultural carrying capacity. And that's the number of animals that we are willing to tolerate. So if, if you're just now planting a garden and you're hoping to get this bountiful harvest, or if you're an agricultural producer and you're experiencing deer damage, your biological carrying capacity may, or your cultural carrying capacity maybe zero. You don't want any deer out there feeding on your uh, feeding on your garden, feeding on your crops. Whereas the, the biological carrying capacity, we could probably host you know, 20 deer per square mile. We have enough vegetation out there to feed them plenty, uh, but because we're trying to grow, our cultural carrying capacity may be just a little bit different. We're not willing to put up with that 20 deer per square mile on, on the landscape. Um, so it's just a couple of ways, different ways we can look at it. We definitely need to consider the habitats that are surrounding us and even on our properties or, or how we're managing those. So it may be this example of no vegetation for them to eat or this picture where there's, there's plenty of food out there, right? There's plenty of vegetation, but it's just not the right food. Uh, we're going to pick on deer a lot tonight because that's probably our number one uh, culprit out there that's feeding on our gardens and, and the crops that we're trying to plant. Uh, so deer are browsers. And so they're going to take a, you know, a clover, a forb, uh, those broadleaf plants that are out there. They'll eat an acorn, a, 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 maybe a maple bud or a beech bud. Uh, they'll eat uh, a soft mass such as blackberries and blackberry leaves. But they're not going to be grazing on our grasses. Uh, and so if they're eating on our grasses, like the you know, fescues that you have in your, in your fields, we've got bigger issues because there's nothing else out there to eat because their systems aren't necessarily built to digest those grasses. And so if they're feeding on grasses, you know, there's really nothing else out there uh, for them to be feeding on. So it may look like there's plenty of food for our wildlife, but it's just not the right food. Uh, and so we need to really understand our, the, the habitat requirements and the needs of the wildlife species that are surrounding us to make sure we're managing for them. So instead of this sort of monoculture of grass, and again, whatever you want to manage for, if we start talking about wildlife management, it, it really is based on your objectives, right? What you want to manage for. If you want to manage for a pristine manicured uh, turf or lawn in, in your backyard, then you've, you've met the mark. But if you're thinking about managing for wildlife, you're, you're probably not providing the, the appropriate vegetation for them to uh, create good habitat for them. So, uh, you know, just again, what is your objective in, in managing for this? But if we're thinking about wildlife habitat and thinking about, you know, managing for wildlife, this is probably not the best case scenario. This is sort of a biological desert, if you will. Uh, but we need to think more diversity. Uh, you know, the, the messier, the wilder it is, the better it is for wildlife. And so now you can still have the, the lawn area that you can mow if you're a big fan of mowing. But now we've got flowering plants for pollinators, which are going to be a, attracting insects. Those insects are going to be attracting birds that feed on those insects. Uh, they've got cover. They've got places to, to forage and feed there. And there's a lot more for a deer to eat even. Uh, so they don't key in on one thing, just eat only one thing, the only one thing that you're, that you're growing there. Uh, so if we're thinking, you know, wildlife management, definitely the wilder, the more diverse it is in your backyard, the more uh, diverse vegetation types and diverse uh, plant 
the species that you have out there, the better off you will be. Uh, so we have to kind of rethink, you know, what is messy. Uh, and a lot of times we love those, those fresh manicured lawns, uh, everything cut up to the edge, under our fence lines, clean. Uh, and so if we're thinking for wildlife management, definitely the messier it is, the better it is. And so uh, we often kid and we talk to landowners, you know, if you've got a, and I'll, I'll say, if you've got a cup holder on your lawnmower, you're probably mowing too much. Uh, I've never been a big fan of mowing myself, and, and you may be, that's, that's quite okay. Uh, so if, if there are any opportunities for me to get out of mowing, I'm going to look for those opportunities and take advantage of them. So I can let things grow up a little bit wilder, allow them to mature, to flower, to create seeds, to feed our wildlife, to feed our pollinators that are out there. So we do have to talk about that. And, and depending on which backyard or what your backyard in your community looks like, you may not be able to. There may be homeowner association rules or whatever it may be. So think about you know, creating more wildlife habitat, a more wildlife friendly uh, backyard to, to give them more to eat so they don't key in on one thing you're trying to grow and our tools may be a little bit more effective at reducing the damage uh, or protecting those things that you're trying to grow. Again, we're looking at our forest across West Virginia. 79% uh, forested, you in the Eastern Panhandle have a little bit less composition out there, a little bit different uh, species composition. You know, most of our forests are, are deciduous forests and we're getting a little bit more conifer component, uh, a little more evergreen component there in the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, but our forests are getting older. Uh, they're getting uh, more mature. Uh, so we have a closed canopy, a reduced amount of sunlight that's actually hitting the forest floor. And we've got some increased deer numbers that are taking care of any vegetation that's growing up on that forest floor. Uh, so if we're thinking about vegetation management in our forest, we're going to think about light management, uh, increasing the amount of light that's reaching that forest floor, uh, this, uh, stimulating those plants to grow and allowing more plants to germinate and grow on the forest floor. Uh, just to keep from having that deer browse issue or that, that nice, clear, kind of park-like setting uh, and creating a more diverse, a little bit more uh, vegetative structure there, provide more food, more forage uh, on the forest floor for our deer to eat. So they would rather be eating in this area, a little bit more protected in this area than they would coming out into the open areas of your backyard or in, in, in your fields. Uh, so again, uh, forest management is something we need to consider. Uh, in terms of opening up some of those forest canopies, allowing more sunlight to hit the forest floor uh, and, and creating more vegetation uh, for them to eat and other wildlife species because this diverse uh, vegetated structure is definitely going to benefit not only deer uh, because it's going to give them more to eat, but it's going to benefit many of our bird species, uh, our uh, ground nesting and shrub layer nesting birds, uh, those are, that are trying to look for not only places to nest but to forage and feed under protective cover even our reptiles and amphibians in these cases. Uh, so, so forest management is, is definitely an option. We need to think about that to think about positive uh, applied wildlife habitat management. Even just letting things grow up and protecting them, and not cutting them, creating these corridors with this vegetative, uh, diverse vegetation in between some of our forage fields, if we're grazing cattle or if we're cutting them for hay, you know, there are areas that we can look at to create more diverse uh, wildlife habitat and diverse vegetation for our wildlife. Uh, in any situation, we're going to be fighting our non-native invasive species. You know, if, if you don't think you have any on your property, you just haven't seen them yet uh, because they're probably there. And in a lot of cases, the only green vegetation that we see in the summer months are these non-native plants that our deer don't eat. And so we've got all the olive there, uh, Japanese stilt grass, uh, tree of heaven, three common, uh, not the only, but three of our common uh, exotic invasive species that are, are really having an impact on our uh, vegetation in our forests uh, and we see that vegetation out there because it's exotic and, and our deer aren't eating them uh, and, and again it's a reduction in quality habitat a reduction in habitat for many other species uh, because of this dominating vegetative component uh, now again another opportunity for you to not only manage uh, applied wildlife habitat you know getting in there and improving habitat quality uh, but also taking uh, some other conservation practices on your uh, on your farms on your properties our USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service or NRCS uh, service programs, uh, conservation programs, or you can get some call sharing uh, for maybe building fences, a, plat a planting pollinator habitat, controlling some of these non-native invasives. Uh, but just some, some USDA, some federal programs that help you call share some of these conservation uh, actions that you can take place on your farm. All right. Now we're we'll talking about, I've gotten that, you know, good wildlife habitat. I got to throw that plug in there because I'm always wanting to, 
Uh, I'm always wanting to, to manage our vegetation across the state of West Virginia to improve habitat quality for many of our, our wildlife species that are out there. But probably our number one concern and our, and our number one issue across the state of West Virginia is the white-tailed deer. Uh, found in all 55 counties, uh, not only do they eat what we're trying to grow in the fall of the year, they're going to be rubbing their antlers. The, the males above should be rubbing their antlers on what we're trying to grow. And we lead the nation. We're looking for maybe a silver lining. We are number one in ranking in the likelihood of a deer vehicle collision. Yay! That's that's not good, but hey, it's something we can hang our hat on, I guess. Uh, but we're looking at you know one in 41, one in 42 drivers are likely to hit a deer this year. Uh, you may be one of those lucky uh, one that have, have met a deer in the middle of the road. West Virginia is a, a perfect example. You know we've got some very curvy roads. Uh, at the bottom of the, the mountains where the deer coming off the mountains to feed down in the lower areas or, or going back up in the mountains to, uh, to rest or bedding areas. Uh, and they just meet in the middle of the road with uh, Buick and the deer meeting. we got some, definitely some, some significant issues with deer vehicle collisions in the state. Uh, and so it's, it, you know, it's, a, it's a common problem uh, across the state of West Virginia. So uh, you're probably not the only one that's uh, experiencing some deer damage. So if we're looking at deer damage or, or wildlife damage management, we're trying to reduce that the damage is caused by deer. They're browsing on what you're trying to grow or uh, rubbing their antlers on the trees that you planted, especially for the tree farmer, that could be a, a pain. We look at first at habitat management. Uh, and, and it goes to a lot of what we just spoke about, that quick little plug at the first. If we have good quality habitat away from what we're trying to grow, uh, it, they're going to be less likely to come in to feed on what we are trying to grow. You can even plant, and, and a lot of landowners will plant what they call lure crops. And so you'll have, they will plant a highly desirable food source. We'll talk about a clover, clover field, uh, clover plot, somewhere on the side of their property so they can give that to the deer. Here, you eat that and not come back over here and try to feed on what I'm trying to grow, not my garden or something. If you're in the ag production, and you're not growing on, on the produce that you're trying to put out a field and make a profit on. Um, and so, you know, lure crops are a potential. Uh, also, managing that habitat away from where you're trying to feed is, is, is a potential to reduce the likelihood that they're going to feed in your area. It's not going to eliminate it completely, uh, but it will help in terms of reemphasizing some of these other techniques and tools that we'll talk about in just a minute. In terms of if it's not as safe, uh, if they're getting more pressure, more issues in your garden, then they'll be more likely to feed somewhere else than in your garden. If there's nothing else to eat out there, they're going to keep coming back and they're going to keep feeding on what on what you're planting there. Um, so again, take take out the grain of salt, um, and it also goes against typically deer considered an edge species, and so they're going to be feeding along the edge. And the edge is where two vegetation types meet. So it may be the edge where this pasture or this this old field meets the forest, and so that's you know short. Uh, herbaceous vegetation that meets right next to the tall woody vegetation between them. That would be considered an edge. And so they would typically feed along that edge. So if there were a large predator, some, some uh, negative stimulus out there, they would jump back into the cover real quickly and escape. Well, you know, we don't have those large apex predators in the state anymore. We don't have the wolves and, and, and mountain lions running all over. Uh, really, only large predators we have are hunters and, and buicks that are driving around the, the, the roads of West Virginia. And so they're a little bit more likely to walk a, a feed away from the edge. And so this, they're not necessarily tied to that edge as they historically would be if there was more negative pressure. Uh, so if we, in some cases, uh, you can look at keeping, and this kind of goes against what I just told you in terms of good applied habitat, wildlife management, uh, or, or wildlife habitat management. Uh, in terms of keeping things messy for reducing the likelihood of deer to, uh, or reducing the, the feeling of being safe for our deer, we can clean those fence rows and cut them down to the ground, you know, basically keeping the vegetation short so they don't have that cover that they can escape into. Uh, but again, you know, this all goes back to what forage, what food is available in those woodlots. You know, if there's nothing for them to eat out there, they're going to keep trying to get into your your produce, your garden, what you're trying to do there. So if we can you know, keep those fence rows uh, and edges clean, that reduces the cover for them. Uh, if we're also managing those forest woodlots to provide them food out there, uh, they'll maybe stay in those areas. 
but in most cases, what we're trying to grow is very palatable to them, is a very attractive to them, and they're going to want to feed on what we're trying to grow. So you can look in some cases, uh, now most of our, you know, you're talking corn, you're talking tomatoes, you're talking strawberries, all these things are uh, a, a favored food for deer. So you can't really change what you're planting in a garden setting. You just have to use some of these other techniques to protect them. But you can, in landscaping, choose plants that are less desirable for uh, for deer or plants that can handle some of the browse. Uh, and you can type in your deer resistant plants uh, and list will pop up. The Extension Service has a list that will pop up. That's the Virginia Division of Natural Resources. Rutgers has a very exhaustive list of the different plants. You kind of fall into those that you, know, that you don't like and won't eat uh, that, and, and those that can handle a little bit of browse um, before they basically die back. Uh, so it can handle some of the deer browse. But it is all related to one, the amount of food uh, that is available for them to eat uh, outside of that. If you, what you're planning, regardless if they like it or not, if that's the only thing that they have to eat, that they're going to be feeding on. You know, they, they, their ultimate goal here is survival. Uh, and so if there's nothing else out there for them to eat, they're going to be focusing on what you're trying to plant. Um, and if there's a large number of deer in your area, again, those that, are, that fall down on the uh, less palatable or less favored uh, plant list are going to move up because that's the only thing they have to eat. Uh, rhododendron is not a highly preferred deer food. You know, the waxy leaves, the, the leaves can be toxic, and, and so there's just not highly preferred deer food. But in the end of February, early March, when there's absolutely nothing else out there in the landscape, deer will eat rhododendron leaves. Uh, and, and so it just depends on what food is available and, and the deer pressure that is out there. And take these deer resistant plants also with a grain of salt uh, because it really depends on the number of deer out there. In most cases, you know, deer don't really like hostas, but if there's nothing else for them to eat. Hostas, you know, that's, if that's what's on the menu, if, and it's the only thing on the menu, that's what they'll go back to. So consider that this with grain of salt, you know, making sure that they have plenty somewhere else other than your garden, uh, and that will reduce the likelihood that they'll uh, strictly and, and, and completely focus on eating whatever you have in your garden. So we, we kind of talked about habitat, but now let's move to the next category of repellents. And there, if you look in, if you walk into any home and garden store, Lowe's, Home Depot, Southern States, whatever it may be, you're going to see a whole wall full of repellents, these chemical repellents on, on the wall. And some of them work, some of them don't. The, the, the effectiveness, I guess, some of these things will work for one landowner in one certain situation, but not work for the next landowner, and it's completely different. And it may be side by side. So there, the effectiveness of this is questionable because it can't be that guaranteed stamp of approval that these things are going to work. And some of them can be quite expensive. So now, uh, if we look at our repellents in general, our repellents are either scent-based or taste-based. Scent-based is one that emits this odor that's, that's a negative stimulus for our deer and will kind of push deer around. They say, oh, it stinks in here. I don't want to come into this area anymore. And they're, you know, the main ingredient on some of those will be blood meal or egg, you know, rotten egg, or sour milk, rotten milk. Uh, those things that as it decays, it creates a, 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 an offensive odor that will keep deer out. And that's kind of the best case scenario. If a deer can walk into an area and smell bad, they're not going to take a bite of, of what they're growing. They're going to leave. The other is a taste-based repellent. And these are a lot of, uh, you'll see like our Miller's, you know, which is basically hot sauce. It's capsaicin is, a, is their number one ingredient. Once they, they ingest that repellent, and so you're going to actually see some more damage because they have to actually eat it, ingest it to get that negative stimulus. And so even if you spray these on plants, they're going to have to feed on it to get that negative stimulus to, to stop eating it. So there should be a, a little period there where they're still eating on the plants that you're trying to protect in the taste-based formula. Uh, and these you know, can get relatively expensive, uh, they have to be reapplied. I don't know if, if you all received the rains that we did this past week here in Morgantown, but there were some, some deluges coming through, uh, and you would have to reapply these after that, but they're going to, to wash off. And so, you know, maybe thirty dollars per gallon uh, if you're applying multiple times, especially during the spring of the year when it's rainy season, or even in the winter when there's a lot of snow uh, snow events coming through. Uh, so it can be it, it can be uh, it can get expensive. And you may still see some of the damage. But 
what may work for you, you know, if it's if it's economically feasible, you know, if you think this will work, you can try it. Uh, and if it works, great. If it doesn't, you haven't lost too much. Because there are some, some kind of uh, home remedies, if you will, uh, that will work to keep deer out of an area. Again, this depends on your situation. It works for some, it, it may not work for others. Uh, but if you hang a bar of Irish spring soap uh, in your landscaping, this is working in some orchards where they've, they've hung a bar of Irish spring soap or multiple bars of Irish spring soap, plus the, the cost of a bar of soap, maybe $2. Uh, and that just the scent that's giving off by that soap is very strong uh, and it will keep deer away uh, because of that scent in, in some areas. Now, you know, some landowners have tried this and, and said, hey, my deer smell Irish spring fresh because they're bathing and stuff. It doesn't always work. So again, you, you've spent $2 on a bar of soap that may or may not work, so that's not a big investment. So you've got to think about the economics of this as well. If you're only losing maybe $10, $15 a year to deer damage, is it worth spending that $30, $40 or, or, or more uh, to protect that? Uh, but if you're losing you know, $500 to $1,000, and depending on whatever it is, I'm just giving those numbers as examples, you know, that may be very well worth it. You know, a very expensive bottle of uh, chemical repellent may be worth it at that time to experience those, those, that level of damage. So consider the economics of this and how much, how much is costing you uh, or what is your threshold, your tolerance level, uh, especially in the dollars uh, that are spent in either replacing plants or dollars lost in the crop, uh, if it's worth investing in some of these more expensive items. Uh, another uh, relatively inexpensive and, and can be, uh, in fact, several cases have been very effective is uh, the application of milorganite. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. So uh, the milorganite is a, what is considered an organic uh, fertilizer. It won't meet organic standards, USD organic standards. It's just made from organic material. Uh, it's uh, a Milwaukee company that takes human refuse uh, and treats it and encapsulates it for a, uh, a nitrogen rich fertilizer. So a bag, a 40 pound bag of middle organite, maybe about 10 to $15. You can take a cup full of this and sprinkle it around your garden, around your landscaping. And it does, it doesn't have that human refuse smell to it, what you might think, but it does have an odor. It's, it's not overpowering. You can still work in your garden without any issues, uh, but it is, uh, you know, deer a little bit of, skittish of coming into these areas with the smell. So it is a scent-based repellent, uh, or it serves as a scent-based repellent, while also fertilizing your garden. Uh, and so, but if you're an organic producer, this will not meet your organic standards, but it, but it, it is made from organic material. Uh, I was talking to my neighbor who, who this has worked extremely well in my neighborhood. He, he will sprinkle it around his, his flower beds, uh, maybe you know, once a week or once every two weeks, and it's keeping deer away uh, but he can't find it right now. It's not on the market because some of the COVID you know, logistics of, of getting uh, issues with the supply chain now. So uh, definitely ch check your local store and see what is available. Uh, so some of these products may not be available in your area just because of supply chain issues. Uh, other, you know, sort of homegrown remedies, people have taken human hair. Uh, so they'll go to their local barber or salon and, and collect human hair and, and bag it up in uh, pantyhose or some kind of uh, open uh, container that will allow the scent to pass through or even sprinkle it within their uh, flower beds in their gardens. That human scent, if, if you are not used to human scent, that, that may be something new to them and keep them out of an area, especially a small area uh, that will reduce some of that damage to maybe experiencing. And, and I'm sure there's no charge for collecting some of the hair at the local barber shop or salon. I think they'll probably give it to you for free if you'll just collect it and pick it up. Uh, and it may work for you. Uh, then again, it, it, again, it does not have the shell of the deer and heat stamp of approval, but it's just another option, something else to consider or think about. It could be a low cost option uh, to hopefully reduce the deer damage. Uh, some other repellents, which may be a little bit more obtrusive, uh, are some of our noisemakers that are out there. Um, I don't know if you've ever, you know, I'm sure none of you have ever been exposed to or used in a potato gun before. Right, uh, it's just basically the same premise here. This is a propane cannon. Hook it up to a propane tank. Your little chamber fills with gas, and then there's a spark that is set on a timer. So every five, 10, 15 minutes, that spark goes off, and kaboom! You know, it just scares the bejesus out of whatever's in front of you. Uh, it just probably won't work in an urban setting. So you'll rattle the windows of your neighbor and probably not make a lot of friends. But on larger agricultural fields, this has been effective. Uh, on airports, we've used this before; it's been effective. 
Um, but any type of spear tech tactic, if you're just using solely one, the deer can get accustomed to it, they'll get used to it, and the effectiveness kind of wears off over time. Uh, and so if you use any type of these noise maker devices or lights, uh, there are also some, some laser devices out there that are available today. Mix it up, you know, keep the deer guessing what's coming next. Is it gonna be sound, is it gonna be light, is it gonna be these lasers coming through? So they are just as confused. If, if you just set it on one setting and it and does the same thing every time the deer walk into the yard, they realize there's no negative stimulus to that and they'll keep feeding. Uh, and so it just loses its effectiveness over time. Uh, so some of these, you know, if, if you think you're going to have deer damage, don't wait till they start teeing in on your on your plants to, to start this. Start early. Uh, if, if you think you're about to have damage, that's when you need to start um, implementing some of these practices and mix it up uh, because it, it does wear off over time. Uh, you can utilize uh, guard animals. Uh, either let your dog chase the deer out of your garden. Uh, you can invest in these specially trained animals that will keep deer out of areas. They're you know, most commonly used, our guard animals are most commonly used in livestock settings where we are protecting livestock from coyotes. Uh, can be very effective at, at keeping coyotes away, whether it be a dog or a burrow, in some cases llamas, uh, because of their hatred of coyotes and they need to protect. Uh, they work extremely well at protecting uh, some of our livestock, but even in uh, backyard settings, if you can let your dog run, chase these deer out, and constantly just, just you know, harass these deer, uh, it can work to reduce um, you know, damage in your backyard, especially in small scale and areas where it's safe to allow your, your dog to, to run free. Uh, if you consider, hey, I need to go out and purchase a livestock or a guard animal, uh, you know, again, think about the cost. You know, the, the cost of the animal, these are not cheap uh, because of specialized training. Uh, room and board vet deals may be associated with it, uh, but it's another option. Uh, it may be more appropriate when we're talking about livestock protection. Uh, so the non lethal techniques for livestock protection than it is for deer, but it can work. If your dog loves to chase deer and will just run uh, them out of the garden or run them out of the backyard and then stop, that works extremely well. And they'll come back in, they get a little exercise, and your, and your deer are scared away from what you're trying to grow out there. Uh, that third category, exclusion. Do we need to build a fence or put up some type of barrier that will keep uh, deer from feeding on what we're trying to grow? Uh, and you know, this, this ranges in that level of protection, again, in, in it relates to our economic status or the economic loss in this. You know, the gold standard is probably an eight foot woven wire fence. You know, that's going to keep deer out. Look at all the numbers, 97, 98% effective at keeping deer out and reducing deer damage. The eight foot woven wire fence is not cheap. Uh, it's also large and you may not have the, the, the right setup for that. Uh, so it's, it's expensive. And if you're only losing, let's say $500 to, to deer damage, you need to build a $10,000 fence to keep them out. So think about the economics of this as well. Can we you know, reinvest those dollars into something that is a little bit smaller scale and it can have very similar protection. Maybe it's a tree tube or, or less uh, robust fence, like a plastic uh, mesh fence instead of that woven wire fence. Uh, and some of these things can be seasonal, you know, eight foot woven wire fence is, is pretty permanent, uh, whereas these kits that can be an eight foot tall fence uh, can be uh, temporary, we can take them up, put them down, move them around, uh, and a lot less expensive. Deer would rather go through or under a fence than over, but once they learn how to jump a fence, again, you know, the, it's the attraction that's on the inside. They learn how to jump a fence, and then as they learn behavior, they learn, they see their other deer comrades jumping over a fence. They'll say, hey, if they can do it, I can do it. Uh, they can still jump an eight foot fence, you know, with the proper motivation behind them. They're just less likely to. Uh, and so, you know, these got the mesh fences that they'll just bump up against it, realize, oh, one, I can't jump over it, two, I can't go through it, and I definitely can't be under it. Um, they, they can be very effective. Uh, so think about the economics and how much that fence costs, how much you're losing, uh, and even the lifespan of the fence. I have worked with some landowners where they were losing around, you know, two to three thousand dollars per year, uh, and they were able to, to fence in their entire field, the entire operation for around six to seven thousand. So in, in two years, you know, just what they saved in uh, those those dollar savings to reducing deer damage, they were able to pay for the fence. So after about two years, they were back into the black uh, and 
we're doing extremely well with the production. So again, think about how long it may take you to recoup those dollars that you spend for that initial investment. Now, you know, there are those free tubes that you can purchase. Uh, we saw here in this previous photo, uh, maybe a dollar and a half to three dollars a piece. Uh, now, if you have a thousand trees, that definitely adds up. So you need to think about that. Uh, either those tree tubes or even wire cages to protect certain trees, certain landscaping uh, to keep deer away. Uh, this can be very effective again. What works in your situation? So I'm talking about a, a broad group. And I don't know exactly your situation. So, you know, throwing several different options out there for you to consider. Uh, again, that gold standard, that eight foot woven wire fence works great at keeping deer out because they, you know, are less likely to jump it uh, and they can't go through it or go under it. But, you know, there's some old estimates here, you know, five to eight dollars per linear foot. And the cost of steel now, I'm sure that's probably double. Uh, they do have a long lifespan uh, and a lot lower maintenance. Uh, but just looking at a 10 acre field based on those numbers can be 13, you know, between 13 and 20,000, dollars So, uh, you know, if, if you're losing five to ten thousand dollars a year to uh, deer damage, yeah, it, this is probably worth it. Uh, if you're only losing your 50 bucks, this is probably not the way to go. Uh, but there are some other options. Uh, like this, this is sort of a plastic fence. These are little kits you can purchase at, you know, online from, you know, Amazon has these types of fence, uh, deer fence as a fencing company, uh, deerfence.com, I believe, uh, Lowe's on Depot in Southern State. We we'll always have all these little small kits you can purchase that will cover a quarter acre, tenth of an acre, half acre, even up to an acre, uh, that you can purchase with this. The fencing itself is plastic, sort of mesh fencing itself. Also the posts that you can put up during the growing season, protect during the growing season and take it down after. Uh, and these kits can range, you know, from just a couple of hundred dollars to a thousand dollars. And again, depending on how much damage you're experiencing, that's a lot less investment for the same amount of protection. Uh, and so these may work in your situation. Uh, a very low cost, but very effective uh, type of fence is what we'll call a peanut butter fence. So what, what uh, as well as damage uh, experts have, have deemed and named the peanut butter fence. So you can either have a single strand electric wire or multi strand electric wire uh, fence that will keep deer out. So the electric fence is going to provide that electric shock that is needed, that negative stimulus that is needed to keep deer out. Uh, now, deer have hollow hair and small feet, so uh, they can walk right through an electric fence and not get shocked. But if they stick their nose or their tongue to the electric fence, well, they're definitely going to receive the shot, and it's going to be that much more effective. So a peanut butter fence is basically putting uh, these aluminum foil flags uh, wrapped around the fence. We're, we're going to conduct that electricity, but we're putting peanut butter on them so the deer will sniff and or uh, lick that peanut butter and get that uh, aluminum foil and get that electric charge uh, that will deter them from going into that area. This can be quite effective in, you know, in some cases, depending on how large of an area can you know, be less than a dollar per linear foot. It can be very effective at keeping deer out. Uh, again, it can be one strand is about you know, two and a half feet, about 30 inches off the ground. You may want to put a lower strand to keep some of the fawns out that are smaller that may go under the fence or reduce the likelihood that they're going to crawl under the fence and avoid that, that fencing. It can be very effective at keeping deer out. Uh, they will come back and test the fence from time to time, periodically, like you saw in that opening photo around the hydrangeas. Uh, I forgot to cut it on. I left it off for a few nights, and eventually they came back and tested it, found that it wasn't on, and had a nice little dinner there on the plant. Uh, so you're going to keep, you keep the electricity to it. And, and in most cases, you're looking at least you know, 4,000 volts. So it may take a, a pretty substantial uh, charger uh, to... to provide enough of that electric charge, that voltage to, to provide enough electric shock to deter them from coming into an area. This is a, you know, very inexpensive. You can put it up, take it down, make sure if you can have kids or if you have neighbors that are walking through the property, let them know that it's up. Uh, so they'll receive a shock as well. This isn't species specific. Anything that touches it's going to, to receive that shock. Uh, but it's, uh, excuse me, a very effective and, and, and low cost tool uh, for keeping gear out. Uh, now, there are variations on this. You know, this was just a single strand, single metal uh, wire. It could be some of this poly wire, poly tape. Uh, this is you know, horse tape. It's about two inches wide. Uh, it's uh, plastic, I believe, but it's got these little wire 
uh, wires that are running through it, so it's flexible. You can, you can string it up and move it around plots. Uh, it's very effective. And in this case, you know, we could smear peanut butter right on the fence uh, and uh, and let them come up and, and stick their nose to it, uh, and we'll see that maybe skin there. Or you know, this one, this was not a peanut butter fence. We didn't spray peanut butter on it. We just had three strands. It worked extremely well at keeping deer out uh, of this, this food plot so we can get it established. Uh, and you look and say, oh, well, look at all this other food, this other green that is around. You know, this is Japanese stilt grass. This is multiple rows, two exotic species that deer don't eat. You know, that's the only green vegetation that is out there. This is a uh, high deer density area, and this electric fence works extremely well at keeping deer out. Uh, so they can be quite effective and still relatively inexpensive. And they have some, you know, there are some black options now that look a little less, uh, a little more conspicuous, I guess, and, and you can blend in a little bit better than this, this bright white tape that is out there, uh, but extremely effective. There are other versions and variations of, you know, high tensile electric fences, uh, the Penn State 5, uh, the Slanted 7, and this basically just set on an angle. Uh, these fences do work well uh, at keeping gear out. Uh, again, you have to keep electricity to it. Uh, to make sure that you know, they're receiving that shot. And it comes to a point now that we also, you know, if we're thinking that this is deer damage, we need to make sure that it is actually deer that's causing the damage and not something else. Um, and if you look at where deer are feeding, one, you can see deer feeding, if you're out there, you can visually see them feeding. Or two, if you just see the damage, deer don't have upper incisors. And so they only have lower incisors. And so when they bite something off, they normally will tear it off. And so there's always a little piece of vegetation, a little tear, a little tendril of vegetation left. Compare that to a rabbit or a bowl, which have both upper and lower incisors. Their teeth are just like a pair of scissors. And so when they cut, it's a clean cut uh, compared to a deer that only has those lower incisors. Um, so I have visited with a lot of homeowners that are you know, cursing the deer for eating uh, tomato plants or something in their garden. And it was actually a bowl uh, or in some cases, rabbits that were feeding on it instead. Uh, so to make sure you know what animal is actually feeding on your, on your plants, causing the damage before you go and start investing in, in some control techniques. Uh, the last, last component we'll talk about is hunting uh, or lethal control. And I would encourage you, if you can hunt, do hunt. Uh, you know, that is a great way to reduce the number of deer out there. Uh, it's a, a fun activity. You can, can put meat in the freezer. Um, great fellowship with, with friends and family. Uh, if you are hunting to reduce uh, the population, focus on the doe population first. Uh, focus on the does. Harvest those first because that is next year's regeneration. If you look at some of our harvest statistics around the state, we're still harvesting more bucks than we are does. So our, our population should be growing based on just harvest statistics. Uh, it's not in some cases because of some habitat and some disease and other issues that are going on. Uh, but focus on the doe population first. That's going to have the greatest impact on the overall population and reducing numbers. Uh, and outside of the hunting season, you can apply for crop deprivation permits. If they're causing damage to crops, um, you can contact your local uh, Division of Natural Resources office, speak to a natural resource police officer and say, hey, I'm experiencing deer damage. They may come out and verify it, but they'll issue you some permits. Uh, that will allow you to reduce the deer population when the crops are actually growing. And that can be a, a negative stimulus in itself. Uh, if deer are feeding the pressure of hunting, if they're seeing you know, the fellow deer fall uh, because of this loud noise, that can make our noises, these loud noise devices, that more effective, uh, just that much more effective because you know, there is a negative stimulus. You know, a, a deer is falling, a deer is dying there beside them. Uh, and so they're seeing that pressure and feeling that pressure and then that's going to just further emphasize those loud noises uh, and can help further reduce deer damage. Uh, now, the issue comes in, how many deer do I need to harvest? Do I need to take every year? And that's, you know, that's based on the number of deer that you have on your property or in your area. And, and deer, unfortunately, don't come in and count off until we don't know the exact number that you have in your area. We can give you estimates based on harvest numbers and, and, and some other information, but it's very hard to determine the exact number of deer that you have, so then how do we harvest the number of deer that we need to to reduce population? Because you know, if you walk out there, you say, okay, well, on, on Tuesday, you walk out, baby, when I came into this meeting tonight, there were four deer in my field. Uh, and then I come and visit with you tomorrow, and I said, well, actually, I saw eight deer in your field. 
And if we actually did a survey to see, you may have a lot more out there. So it's kind of hard to know those numbers. And based on that, I would recommend that you harvest the deer or continue to harvest the deer at, a, at a, an amount where you can start seeing the damage. It may take you a couple of years to start seeing that reduction in damage. And so you're going to harvest and harvest heavy, uh, maximizing the number of, of doe that you can remove from the, the, the property. Uh, and it may not be just you, you may have to involve multiple hunters uh, to, to reduce the deer population to start seeing that reduction in damage. And it may take a couple of years for you to see that, that actual reduction. If we just look at an undisturbed deer population and give you some general numbers here based on, you know, it's a 36 deer per square mile with a three to one doe to buck ratio. That's probably not in most cases, our doe to buck ratio is much higher. You may have five, six does for every buck that is out there. So that just means uh, an additional number of, of females that are out there uh, potentially producing offspring that increases deer population. We'll just give them a, a general number of 36, three to one ratio. 90% of those does are going to have 1.3 falls. It's just some general averages. I know you can't have 1.3 falls, but over, over the average, uh, that's what it comes out to. So 24.3 of those does will have 1.3 falls. That's 32 new deer. And given no other mortality, you know, starvation, uh, disease, deer vehicle collisions, or hunting, you know, your population can grow significantly in just one year. And so we went from 36 deer to 68 in just one year. Uh, and so you know, you've got to, to harvest a lot of deer and continue that harvest over, over multiple years to, to actually reduce that number so you can start seeing a reduction in deer damage. Uh, you know, even in a hunting population, let's say one individual went out there, same scenario, 36 deer, 31 ratio. We harvested the max number of does that we could. These numbers kind of vary depending on where you are in the state. Uh, harvested the maximum number of does and even took a couple of bucks, a maximum number of bucks uh, to, to just get more mouths off of the landscape. You know, we're still only reducing the number of does from 27 to 21. 90% of those, 1.3 fawns. So we still grow by 24.6, we'll call it 25 fawns. So our deer population still grows from 20, 28 after the hunting season to 53. So it may take more hunters you know, than just one out there harvesting the minimum uh, or even the maximum for one hunter uh, to reduce those numbers, to effectively reduce the deer population. And I think the, the average home range size of deer is about a square mile. Uh, average parcel size across the state of West Virginia is about, about 30 acres. And so uh, 640 acres in a square mile, you know, our property may only be a small piece of the entire puzzle. So we need to, to work with neighbors and, and, and adjacent landowners to, to help reduce the overall population uh, through hunting. But it's another tool, it's another technique that's going to help reduce some of that deer damage. Enough about deer. We've picked on them enough tonight. We'll talk about a culprit that has uh, gotten away, I think, with a lot of damage because we're blaming it on deer, uh, which is our eastern cottontail rabbit. Our cute, cuddly little bunnies, right? As soon as they get into the garden, they turn from a cute, cuddly, cuddly bunny to that dang rabbit that's out there eating our, our, our flower beds. Uh, you know, if we're thinking about habitat management, we want to remove, remove any type of cover uh, that rabbits may find uh, outside of, obviously outside of our uh, our garden, because that's going to be providing cover. I've got a, a a rabbit that is now living in my flower bed, and I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm willing to tolerate the damage that it causes, causes just so I can see you know, a couple of bunnies hopping around in the yard. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm willing to put up with that. But you know, if I wanted to, surrounding my house, there's no other cover, so that's the only cover available to them. That's why they're living uh, in our flower beds. Uh, and so remove any available cover that may provide protect, protection for them. Uh, and this is the, the spring of, springtime of the year right now. So this is, this is what I found today on one of our research plots. You know, this grass uh, is, is only about, you know, just a few inches tall now. I guess this tall bunch grass is about uh, six to eight inches. But if you look right here, this little puff of fur, this is actually a rabbit nest. Uh, and they've already started nesting. It didn't look like much. Rabbits don't need much to lay a nest. It's just basically a, a, a low-lying depression they may dig out and, and, and basically cover or line with their fur. You know, this one has covered it. You know, a female rabbit has come in and, and pulled out a lot of fur and created a nest. It may just look like a ball of, of dead vegetation there, but they collect vegetation surrounding it uh, or collect vegetation around it to create this nest. But there were four to five young bunnies, young rabbits in this nest, basically you know, flushed to the ground. 
And a lot of landowners will find this, you know, the first mowing of the year, when they mow through the, 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 the yard or the, the pastures, and it may just lie like a dead spot in the yard, but it's actually a rabbit nest. Uh, so be on the lookout for these, um, but they can cause damage. I know they're, they're fun to see out there, but they can cause damage. But habitat management wise, we want to remove any cover that they may have. Uh, repellents, there are some, just like our deer away, uh, there are some rabbit away repellents uh, that will be scent and or taste based repellents that again have sort of that questionable effectiveness in terms of, of keeping uh, the browse down from, from rabbits. Uh, they, they do have the upper and lower incisors. So when they're cutting on something, you know, they're going to, it's going to be a clean cut or they'll also be chewing, uh, experiencing damage in, in a neighbor's yard of, of my rabbit, sorry. My rabbit was chewing on their landscaping. Well, it was, they, they say it was my rabbit. Uh, was chewing on their landscape. You can see where they were gnawing on the low-lying branches of some of their woody vegetation. So they were eating down to that cambium layer uh, of their, their plants in, in their yard. Uh, and so you'll see that both upper and lower incisors, you can see where it's actually chewing on that. Um, and so, you know, they can feed up to about 24 inches, maybe depending on the size of the rabbit and how high they can stretch up. So if you see damage that's above 24 to 30 inches, that's probably a deer. In some cases, we'll talk about a bowl in just a moment. Uh, it's probably not a rabbit above that 24 inch mark. So anything from the ground, 24 inches down to the ground, may be a rabbit. So consider a rabbit when you're thinking about the damage. A deer will eat all the way down to the ground as well. So don't rule them out. Uh, so it could be one of the two that are feeding in there. Uh, so if you want to keep them out of your landscape and keep them out of your garden, those repellents may work. Again, you have to re re uh, apply them over and over, uh, depending on the weather and how much rain has washed them off. Or you can build these little uh, either hardware cloth or small diameter uh, screen cloth. You can build these fences from the ground to about 24 to 30 inches off the ground. It, rabbits simply can't climb over that. Uh, and, it, and it works and it's very effective at keeping rabbits out of an area. But it's a lot of, lot of labor that goes into putting this fence. In some cases, you may need to bury it because they can dig and kind of burrow under. So you may need to bury it down about six inches so, so rabbits don't burrow under. So that can be a lot of work that goes into it. Uh, but it can work to keep uh, rabbits out. A dual fence like that, so that plastic mesh uh, uh, wire uh, fencing that we can use for um, deer will also work on rabbits. And so you can keep deer and rabbits out with that small diameter uh, mesh, either wire or plastic uh, fencing you can keep deer out and rabbits out of an area because they can't climb over and they can't get to that small diameter. Uh, if you have a, you know, the two and a half to a larger diameter, uh, they can probably squeeze through those small holes, especially the small bunnies, uh, once they're able to get out of that nest. Uh, so, uh, you know, you want to make sure it has very small diameter to keep our rabbits out. Uh, also, we, you know, that, that final one, that lethal control, uh, they do, we do have a regulated hunting season on, on rabbits. Uh, and so you can look at the fall of the year when hunting season comes in to reduce the number of rabbits in the year if they're causing damage. Uh, there's that, that, that nest again. But another culprit that kind of gets away uh, and some of their damage is blamed on deer are our voles. Voles, which is different than moles, that we'll talk about in just a minute. This is V-O-L-E-S. These are small rodents. We have about five different species that occur here in West Virginia. The most common one is the metal vole that you have here or the red back vole, which will actually have a, a small red uh, just rusty patch down its stripe down its back. Looks like, a, looks like a small mouse. They're kind of stocked here, a little bit fatter, if you will, uh, reduced ears. Uh, they are semi-fossorial. So they'll, they'll kind of dig these little burrows underground that they can get into and, and, and build a nest or a bur burrow underground. But most of their activity is above ground. And so they create these raceways or these little tunnels through the thatch of the grass, the mulch in your yard. But now that all of our snow is off uh, of our, of our of our lawns, we now see these tunnels because they're active year round, 24 seven, they're active. Uh, and so they're creating these little raceways uh, under the snowpack, in the thatch layer, in the grass, this above ground. So they're, they're herbivores and they're feeding on vegetation uh, and they may be clipping your vegetation like you see, you know, especially low down to the ground. If you have a lot of thatch around your trees, they can chew and gnaw on the bases and the roots of our trees and plants. Had a couple of landowners who they came out and all of their plants were dead. And once they tried to pick one up, it's like it had been sheared off right at the mulch layer. And these were.
voles that were crawling basically through the mulch layer and just eating uh, the roots and, and the base uh, of those plants. And they can also climb up into plants and clip vegetation off the top. So they can climb up above that 24 inch threshold, if you will, uh, that rabbits can't get above. And you know they'll be feeding on your, you know, clipping off tomatoes and dropping them down to the ground. And you're cursing those deer for eating those, those higher up plants, uh, those higher up leaves and, and tomatoes, where it's actually a vole that has crawled up into or climbed up into these plants and are clipping vegetation. So if you, again, if you look, because they have upper and lower incisors, if you look at you know, the cut itself or where the vegetation is clipped, uh, if it is a clean cut, it's going to be a bowl uh, or, or something with those upper and lower incisors. You may have to look at multiple feedings because not all not all tears look the same if, if a deer is feeding on it. Um, but you know, you also look at other things. You know, if you have deer tracks coming into your, your landscape, you know, that may be deer. They could be at least one of the culprits out there. But don't overlook these little small herbivores. Uh, for habitat management for our voles, it would be removing that thatch layer and allowing some of our biological control agents, such as our hawks, owls, even your house cat, if you will, to go out there and feed on these that are that are uh, can be feeding around in your, in your turf layer and your mulch layer uh, of your yards and, and your landscaping. So you can either cut your grass shorter and expose them to the elements or expose them to some of those avian predators that will be. Uh, flying around uh, or remove the mulch from your landscaping. Uh, and in some cases, you know, that you can put up mats uh, or put gravel in and around your uh, fruit trees uh, that they really can't burrow through. They can't dig under, so they're going to have to crawl over, and that's going to expose them to whatever uh, avian predator that may be uh, perched up above. Uh, so that would be changing the habitat for them. Repellents, there are some what they'll call bowl repellents. You know, again, questionable effectiveness. There, there are better tools and techniques out there. Um, there are, uh, you know, if you think about building a fence, that kind of, that rabbit fence will potentially keep them out, but they're relatively good climbers, so they may be able to climb over that 24-inch fence. Uh, so it may not work as well. Uh, so repellents and exclusion, in, in terms of the fencing, may not be you know the, the best tools. There are toxicants that are available. We have about three or four that are registered here in West Virginia uh, that are lethal for, for bowlers. Uh, be careful uh, to make sure your pets don't get into these or if you find any bowl carcasses that our other avian predators may get into because we don't want that secondary toxicity. We don't want them to pick up these carcasses and then die from the, the toxin or the poison that we put out. Uh, so if you're, if you're using these types of toxic, toxicants, find the tunnels, the raceways that they are using, or even find the burrows where they're going underground. And it may just be a quarter size hole in the ground at the end of one of these raceways, uh, but that's where you want to put these baits, these toxicants, uh, so you're making sure you're getting it down in there where the bowls may be feeding. And then look for any carcasses around uh, to make sure you clean those up and don't allow your pet or, or some other uh, wild, wild animal out there to feed on them. Uh, another, especially in smaller areas in our backyards, uh, we can use these small little snap traps, just the Victor mouse traps. Uh, you can bait them with peanut butter uh, that will work, or even unbaited if you'll just place the treadle in that raceway. So when the animal runs across, you know, going along that raceway within, in the, the thatch layer above ground, they run across that treadle, you can capture that way. And just you know, five or six of these mouse traps in a small area, I'm not talking large fields or, or agricultural settings, uh, can be very effective at reducing bowl populations, uh, very inexpensive as well. Uh, you may want to put some type of cover like this little handmade uh, tent that we can put over these traps to keep other birds and, and, and maybe other wild animals out of it so you can only focus in on the, uh, the bowls and, and not your cat or, or some of the songbirds that may be feeding in your backyard. But very effective at, at, at controlling especially small areas in gardens and, and lawn type of settings. And our voles are, their populations are cyclical. And so every three to five years, you'll have this vole explosion, or even small mammal explosion. Uh, and so there'll be voles everywhere. And then the populations will die off for a couple of years. And then their, their populations rebound and their voles everywhere. And then or the population dies down for, for a few years. And so just keep in mind, you may be in the high uh, uh, wave of that vole population, that high trough of that, that vole population. So you may have a lot of uh, bowls in your area at this time, or you may not see any at all, depending on, on, on where they are. But they can get away with some of the deer damage 
uh, or deer are blamed for some of the bowl damage that is out there uh, because of their ability to climb up into the vegetation to actually forage and feed. So they are herbivores. Now, you know, these are bowls. Compare that to our moles, M-O-L-E-S. Uh, our moles are insectivores, and so they're feeding on the, the insects, primarily the earthworms that are out there in the soil in our, in our backyards, in our gardens. Uh, they are the ones that create that raised earthen tunnel. And so if you see these little raceways in your backyard where the, the earth itself is raised up, and so the animal is burrowing, they're completely fossorial. They're burrowing uh, within the soil, underneath the, the, the vegetation, uh, looking for insects. Uh, those are our moles. And so those, we have three different species of moles. They're in the eastern panhandle. You may, they may be a little bit farther south for you. You may get the uh, southeastern mole, which has a, uh, a naked tail or no hair on the tail, uh, or the hairy tail mole. And this one does have hair on the tail. Uh, they're all kind of, or they're both uh, distinguished by these large uh, modified outturned forelimbs that are just perfect for digging. You know, they are digging machines. Reduced eyesight because they, they, they spend most of their time underground, but they'll create these raised tunnel raceways in your backyard, in your turf, and in your gardens. Uh, the you know, habitat management for them would be to reduce the number of insects. So you want to reduce the number of earthworms that are available for them to feed on. Now, you know, our soil systems themselves are, are, are very fragile and a healthy soil will have a lot of microbes and insects that are turning over that soil, a lot of, a lot of earthworms that are, you know, processing that soil and, and the material that is in them. So a healthy soil, and that's what we want, is very good habitat for our moles. And so again, take it with a grain of salt. If, if, you know, if they're causing that much problem, you can reduce the amount of insects and maybe reduce the health of your soil, uh, but it is an option. Uh, other than that, you know, most of our backyards and our forest fields and uh, our forest and our fields are uh, prime areas for our moles to be, to be feeding and foraging. Uh, repellents, there are some Mole repellents available, again, mixed results because most of them have to be down below ground. There are some of these sonic devices, ultrasonic devices that you can you know, stick down into the ground and it sends out these ultrasonic pulses that uh, supposedly scare away uh, voles and mole. Mixed results on that. Uh, again, there's no guaranteed stamp of approval on that. Uh, so there's really no repellent that this really works effectively for them. You can, uh, you know, dig down and create barrel, bury either flashing or tin or hardware cloth to create this barrier uh, that you see here to keep moles from digging into your yard. A lot of labor goes into that. And so you know, it depends on how bad the problem is. There are some mole toxicants that are available to, uh, to your local uh, store, uh, zinc phosphide in some cases. They even have uh, earthworm shape Toxicant, so it looks like an earthworm that you can drop down into these mole holes. Uh, it, it's, it's fairly effective. Uh, our moles prefer live prey, uh, and so something that's laying there is less attractive to them than a live earthworm that's right next to it. Uh, so it can work. Uh, some of the better devices and tools, because in most cases our, our mole numbers are not just out of control, like our bowl populations can get. Uh, there are several mole traps that are available. Uh, local stores online. Uh, there's the harpoon style trap that you see here. Uh, there's a scissor style trap that you can see. Uh, these are placed over these raised earthen tunnels. Uh, so when the animal tunnels through, it sets the treadle off and those, those spikes, the harpoons, basically stick down into the ground and lethally you know, it, it kills the, the mobile underground. Uh, they will use a network of tunnels daily and then they'll use some of the tunnels weekly. And so if you have these tunnel situations in your backyard, go through and step on a couple of places around the tunnel system and see which ones they're using daily. And that's where you want to place these traps. And it basically you know, just sticks down over the, the, tunnel, the, the, you know, the tunnel itself or with these spikes raised and this little treadle set on top of that tunnel. So when they come through to raise that earth again, it sets off the treadle and you can remove the moles. So very effective at controlling you know, moles in our backyards. Uh, coyotes are another issue. Uh, around the state of West Virginia, our populations are growing. They are an opportunistic omnivore, can make do and 
in whatever uh, environments we give them. Uh, they're doing extremely well. Uh, about four or five years ago, uh, they were estimated about uh, about 10,000 know, uh, coyotes in the state, if I'm remembering those numbers correctly. Uh, but their numbers are growing, uh, and they're definitely uh, here to stay. Uh, and they can create problems if you're, especially if you're raising livestock. Um, so habitat management, you know, they, they make do in most any type of habitat. Um, we've seen them outside Newton Field in Chicago, Central Park in New York, downtown Charleston, West Virginia. Uh, so they're very adaptable to whatever environment they live in and they move a lot in, in great distances. Uh, so repellents, you know, there'll be claims you may read that if you put wolf repellent or wolf uh, urine in some areas, you know, they smell that dominant apex predator and they, they run, but how many, you don't have any wolves running around, so that may be more curiosity for them here in West Virginia. They'll probably come up to it and, and, and urinate on it themselves if you place that out there. Fencing can work, uh, but you have to have an electric wire attached to that, uh, so they can climb quite well. This is an eight-foot chain link fence with a two-foot barbed wire outrigger on it that, that they were climbing over, getting into our uh, native field down now, of course, in South Carolina uh, nightly. Uh, and so they can climb fences very well, but if you put an electric wire down towards the base, uh, six to eight inches off the ground and six to eight inches away from the fence itself, uh, it can work to deter coyotes. And also put one up at the top of the fence. So if they do get over the first one uh, and get up to the top, they can get shot. Even adding one in the middle of the fence uh, can, can help reduce that. But a good, strong fence can uh, keep coyotes away um, and, and be effective at protecting livestock. Uh, there, you know, there are guard animals available, you know, either a, a burro or a llama or a special trained dog uh, that can work to uh, protect livestock. Um, which is another non lethal technique. Um, you can also, you can sign up with USDA Wildlife Services. It's a federal agency here in West Virginia. They have a livestock protection program here in West Virginia. Uh, you can sign up with them and they will work with you to develop a um, coyote removal plan where they can lethally remove coyotes. There's some uh, specialized tools available to them that we don't have as uh, private citizens in the state of West Virginia. Uh, but it's still a fascinating species and if they're not causing your problems, uh, then, then you know, just enjoy them on the landscape because they are a phenomenal species that are out there. I'm not saying that you know, they may not start causing problems tomorrow, uh, but if they're not causing problems today, um, once you remove that one coyote, there's just another one waiting in the land to fill its place. Uh, so it will be a, a constant battle uh, with, with coyote removal, uh, which if you're a trapper, that, that's a lot of fun. Uh, it's enjoyable. There is some, some money in the pelts. You can sell their pelts. Um, and so there may be some private trappers that are out there willing to help you, federal agency and USDA Wildlife Services, or some uh, private contractors, nuisance wildlife control operators that are willing to come in and trap coyotes for you if it comes down to that, that, that need for lethal removal. Uh, vultures are also a growing concern, and you in the Eastern Panhandle have been uh, facing this a little bit longer than we have here on the, the western side of the state. Uh, black vultures in particular, we have two vultures that occur here in the state, uh, turkey vulture and black vulture. Turkey vulture is in a black body with a red head, uh, and a black vulture has a black head. Black vultures are a little bit more aggressive than our turkey vultures, and their populations are increasing. One, we have a lot of deer vehicle uh, deer on the side of the road from deer vehicle collisions, so there's a lot of food out there. Great biological service of cleaning up, you know, these dead animals on the landscape, uh, but uh, are, are now becoming a nuisance in some cases. They're roosting on houses, uh, cell towers, water towers, other uh, trade domestic structures. They are, uh, they have an affinity or some attraction to rubber gaskets, uh, you know, on uh, exhaust pipes on top of houses, windshield wipers, rubber gaskets around windshields. Um, a lot of reports have been de uh, destroying boat covers and trailer covers and seat cushions. Uh, so we're causing some issues and they will attack, especially if you have uh, you know, newly birthed lambs or calves uh, or goats, you know, they have attacked those birthing animals or, or calves, and even pets in some cases. Uh, so our black vultures are, are becoming more and more of a problem and getting more and more calls about black vulture damage. Uh, they are protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. You can harass them, but you can't kill them. Uh, so uh, harassment works extremely well. And so those uh, pyrotechnics, those nice noise makers that I showed you before with the deer, uh, if you're going out there every night to disturb the roost, if they're roosting in your barn or in a tree outside your house, you can scare them away. They take you a few nights, but they, they respond well to uh, disturbance like those loud noise makers and repellents. 
Uh, this is an example of, this is a, maybe you can see this is a dead vulture that is hanging there, uh, hung in effigy, um, basically like a scarecrow, scarecrow, the technique of the scarecrow, and it works extremely well at keeping deer, uh, keeping vultures away. Uh, they don't like to see one of their own hanging there, and so they will leave and disperse pretty quickly. Now, you have to have a, a federal permit to actually kill one to take that, and you have to apply through the Fish and Wildlife Service and the USDA Wildlife Services. It may take you a month or two to get a permit, uh, but you can contact USDA Wildlife Services if you're experiencing problems with vultures, uh, uh, and they can help you develop a plan uh, to reduce that damage. Uh, in other cases, you know, if you have, you know, don't, uh, if you have any carcasses, you need to bury those carcasses. Uh, don't leave any rotting food or garbage out that may attract vultures. Uh, those are, are things that are, are bringing vultures in. So again, the habitat manager would be just to clean up and any type of food source that they may be attracted to. Uh, Canada geese are also an issue. We're getting more and more calls about because of the local population. Historically, these would be migrating back north this time of year. Uh, but they're, they're realizing, hey, it's a great place to set up house and home here um, all across the, the mid-Atlantic down in the southeast. Uh, so they're raising them, and they're increasing numbers, causing more and more issues, especially in agricultural settings because they are herbivores. And they're eating what you're trying to plant out there. Uh, but these are a lot of issues on golf courses. There's some studies out there showing how much poop they have per square meter. Uh, and so it may be a good, uh, you know, there's a lot of poop coming out. Uh, of that goose, but the, the, the fecal matter and the, and the damage to some of our crops is a big issue. Uh, again, these are protected in the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and so you need to talk with a federal agency to make sure you have the perfect permits uh, to lethally remove them, but you can harass them, uh, and, and depending on how, uh, you know, how much they like your area, I mean, they, they, in some cases they respond well to harassment, but in others they're, they're pretty stuck, especially if they start to nest, and, and we're seeing them start to nest now they're pairing up and they're, they're making the So it'd be a little bit harder to get rid of them or repel them and scare them away this time of year. Uh, that's another issue that, that we see you know, in, increasing across the state. Uh, poultry, I had a lot of calls this past spring about weasels and mink getting into poultry houses. Uh, two different species here, they're both mustelids, long, slender bodies, short legs, uh, are you know, long tailed weasel, very common across the state. Uh, about the 12 to 15 inches long, you know, maybe one to two inches thick, uh, and they can get into some very small crevices. Our mink are a little bit larger, 20 to 24 inches long, uh, two and a half to three inches thick. They can still get into these small crevices, and they can get into an unprotected chicken coop uh, relatively easily, and they are surplus killers. They'll basically kill all the chickens in the coop and kind of pile them up for you. Uh, you know, if your chickens are disappearing, it, it may be a fox. Uh, if they're all piled up dead in one area, it's probably one of the weasels or the mustelids, uh, either a mink or a weasel, is causing that damage. And in those cases, you just want to make sure that the you know, poultry houses are secure. Uh, there are no small cracks and crevices they can uh, get into and, and cause that type of damage. Uh, and it can be significant in some cases. Uh, so we'll hit the we'll hit the pause button there. Maybe we have some questions. I'll try to get to the chat here. Uh, we did see. have a couple, Sheldon. Okay. Um, I'll Before start. We that, you know, if you have any questions or comments, please shoot me an email. If you have a specific issue that you want to talk about, shoot me an email there, sheldon.owen at mail.wdu.edu. Call, get any of the calls, she knows how to get in touch with me, uh, or call me in the office. Make the, the, I'm not in the office now because of COVID, so it takes a little while for that message to get to me. But I will get it and I will get back to you. But shoot an email is the best way to. Uh, uh, so, Chuck asks um, he gets the lack of forest vegetation as a reason that deer will come out of the forest to find food, but why would they go through 30 or 40 acres of commodity crops to graze in the garden? So, that's a good question about their behaviors. Yeah, that, that is interesting. And so, in, in most cases, deer are, are browsers. And so they're going to come in, we're going to eat a few of the soybeans coming through. They're going to eat, you know, maybe the, the corn that's been planted, the wheat that's been planted, and then they'll take a bite of the tomatoes that you planted. You know, they're just going through eating a diverse, you know, diet. They're not grazers, and so they're not like a cow that's going to stick there on one acre of, of grass uh, and feed con consistently. Uh, and so uh, if they've got that other food, so the soybeans, uh, corn, wheat out there, if there's, you know, any fencing or the repellents, should be more effective 
uh, because they've got something else out there to eat. Uh, but again, you know, if they have all you know, this good buffet of food out there, they're still going to browse through and pick on because they do have a preference and what I don't know what they're feeding on there in New York, but it may be a highly preferred or even more preferred than, than the soybeans or, or the wheat or corn that's out there in the field. Um, so in most of these cases, I, I have to speak in generalities because I don't know the specific situation that you're, that you're dealing with, what you're growing, what's going on. Uh, but they are, you know, they're, they're picky animals. Uh, and and they, they decide, okay, I don't want to eat soybeans today. I'm going to eat uh, the azaleas in, in, in your yard. And, you know, it's just they're, they're browsers and they're going to pick through and, and, and pick and choose as they go through. Uh, so I would suspect and they should, uh, based on normal behavior, be feeding on the, the soybean field. Uh, and, and, and if you throw some type of repellent or scare tactic or something that gets a little bit of a negative stimulus around your garden, I would think they'd be more effective because they do have something else for them to be out there. Uh, Dr. Ellen suggests missing uh, any kind of milk half and half with water, spray and let dry. Yep. Uh, so you'll look at some of those, you know, $30 a gallon uh, repellents, and it is just basically milk. Uh, it is the capsaicin. Not capsaicin, it's the, uh, what's the protein in milk? It's just like, uh, just breaking down and causing that, that, that stink. So yeah, just, you know, pick up a $2 a gallon of milk let it spoil uh, and start spraying that or pouring that in some of the landscaping and it can work to keep uh, beer away. And again, yeah, that's a good point. If it's not washed off by rain, you need to reapply periodically because eventually those proteins break, break down and no longer get off that, that negative scent. Um, uh, the so the next question box. is about uh, for deer and fence. I'm just reading them so the recording will register. So for deer and fencing, I've read they don't like jumping into a small area, but I can't find what the definition of a small area is. Any ideas to clarify that? It's, it's, there's not an exact measurement on that. Uh, deer have kind of poor depth perception. And so if they're on one side of the fence and they can see the other, uh, that looks like an object that they can't, they can't jump over. It looks wider than it actually is. And so they are less likely to jump the fence into a small area than they are than they are into a large open field. Um, a, another way to kind of recreate that, you can zigzag your fence. Instead of having just a straight line, if you want to put up a temporary fence, you can zigzag that fence and it gives, the, it, gives it the appearance of a wider fence than it actually is. And so that, that, that reduced depth perception there uh, or the ability for them to see across the fence, a 10 by 20 foot fence uh, or, or garden uh, like you mentioned there, with a, a good visible fence on either side, uh, you know, that may work. Uh, it, it, again, it depends, uh, I know we hate to hear that answer, but it depends on the situation and what's in that uh, and their learned behavior. If they see one deer doing it, uh, more will come in and jump in. So hopefully you're right. Hopefully a 10 by 20 foot garden uh, with, a, with a good visible fence will look too wide for them to jump into uh, and can reduce that uh, likelihood of them jumping into it. And John asked the best question, best way to remove groundhogs? Groundhogs. Uh, you can trap and remove groundhogs. Uh, you know, you cannot, and I didn't mention this earlier, you cannot relocate wildlife. So if you, if it's a groundhog or if it's a raccoon or possum, you can't trap it on your property and drive it down the road and release it. Uh, that's illegal to do. Uh, so if you trap it, you have to euthanize it. Uh, or release it somewhere else on your property. Uh, and it's more than likely just going to come back to your property. There's a couple of reasons why, you know, you're, if you move that animal, you may be uh, giving that problem to someone else. Uh, so, so don't get any ideas and give this to someone you don't like, or don't move this to someone you don't like. Uh, so don't give the problem to someone else. And you're also moving a biological package. You don't know what kind of disease or parasites that animal may be, may be carrying. You don't want to introduce that into a new area. And third, you know, that animal is going to try to get back to his home range, try to get back to his home. So there's kind of a lot of stress on that animal because it's going to come in contact with cars and other other wildlife. It's going to be, uh, you know, a lot of stress on that animal itself by trying to get back home. So uh, you can trap and euthanize them. Uh, they're, they're kind of trap shy. Cantaloupe uh, or strawberries uh, are, are your best bait to get them into a, a cage trap. Uh, but you have to have some way to actually euthanize those animals. 
Uh, you can, you know, there's, there's really an open season on groundhogs so if you can safely and legally uh, discharge a firearm in your area, uh, you, can, you can legally remove them uh, at any time throughout the year. Uh, there's no season on them uh, for that way. Uh, so either trapping or, or legally removing is probably the best option uh, for groundhogs. Uh, they do, they can cause issues and, you know, they're burrowing under these domestic structures and compromise the integrity of that structure and causing holes for ankle breakers for you and for, for livestock to go out in the field. Uh, but yeah, trapping, which can be tough, can be, can be frustrating, uh, or shooting is the best way to remove groundhogs. So one more in the chat, then we'll go over to the Q&A. And uh, the question is, what kind of crops would you recommend to tempt deer? So she wants to keep them away from the garden, but um, is not opposed to providing okay. other sources of food for them. Yeah, some of, some of your best, you know, depends on the amount of sunlight uh, those we, uh, we see. Uh, probably, you know, the most common one is, is our clovers. So a white clover or red clover patch, you know, deer love those clovers. Uh, and so that will be a lure crop to keep them, well, hopefully keep them away. But as we saw earlier where uh, uh, Chuck was having an issue with him walking through soybeans, uh, clovers are probably a highly preferred food. One would consider soybeans a highly preferred food as well. Uh, but our clovers would be a great, relatively inexpensive uh, seed that you can throw out there uh, and create sort of a lure crop to keep them away, give them something else to eat. Uh, and, and it's relatively inexpensive. You know, in the winter times, you know, those are cool season uh, growing plants. Um, so in the summer, you may have uh, some other you know, issues with trying to get established or growing. Uh, and you may want to consider some of the warm season plants, such as soybeans or buckwheat. In our Q and A um, question is earlier you mentioned using human hair to deter deer. Can Shetland sheepdog hair be used? Yeah, it, I, I don't know any research that's looked at that, but that's possible. Uh, you know, you can also use if you can have uh, the dog urinate in that area. You know, that scent may also think, okay, this is a new dog in the area. It's a new scent. Uh, you know, people have used coyote urine uh, and or wolf urine in some cases uh, to use as a scent to uh, scare these animals away or repel these animals. Um, so it, it, it's possible. It, it depends on how much interaction those deer have with the uh, cheap dogs that you're, you're, you're talking about. Uh, so it's, it's definitely possible. It's, it's potential. Uh, but again, I, would, I wouldn't put my uh, stamp of approval on that because I just don't know the data on it. Uh, see, it's worth a try. You can get it for free and uh, see if it's attainable. Give it a try, see if it works. Let me know if it works. You can email and say, "Hey, this is the best tool ever." Uh, I'll start. I'll start promoting it across the state. That may be a new business opportunity for you. Sell them in little packages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. If right there, um, I don't think there's any other questions, but uh, let's. Uh, thanks Sheldon for taking the time to share his knowledge. Wildlife is so tricky and that's why I try to explain to people because they have a brain and that's probably the hardest part. So they get smarter, but we just, we're, I like to think we're smarter than most wildlife. So well, I hope they I have their place outside the garden. Yeah. yeah, they prove me wrong a lot when I say that too. They, they outsmart me a lot of times. <laughs> Uh, it's fun, and that's what I enjoy working with them because they throw you curveballs all the time. So uh, it's a lot of fun. But yeah, if you have any questions, comments, please shoot me an email, get in touch with Emily. I'll help you out any way that I can. If I don't know the answer, I'll find someone who does and, and, and let you know. So thank you all for letting me come in and talk tonight and have a great uh, day out there tomorrow, maybe in the rain. Uh, maybe maybe we'll hold off on, on more planting until next week so the weather breaks a little bit better. Uh, yes. But it um, is and good luck. Thank you to everybody that has participated in the program. Thank you for your great levels of engagement throughout all the sessions. And I wish everybody a happy gardening season. Absolutely. Enjoy. Good luck. Thank Have you. a good evening, everyone. Thanks, Sheldon.